Hi everyone. Um, so thank you, Joe. Um, so I'm Robert Chapman. I'm a philosopher of disability, uh, currently speaking from Sheffield in England, and I'm a white, uh, kind of male presenting person in my early 30s uh, with dark hair. And behind me is a wall and a quite blurry picture. Um, so I'm really happy to be chairing this session with Isaac Chang. Um, Isaac is a PhD candidate at McMaster University, and his work is situated at the intersection of phenomenology, critical infrastructure studies, and classical Chinese philosophy. He recently did a uh, really interesting interview uh, on biopolitical philosophy, uh, so I, I strongly advise having, having a look at that um, when you get a chance. Um, and today he's talking about infrastructures of propriety, holistic rights in a neuroqueer in sorry and neuroqueer counterpublics. Um, so yeah, please put your uh, questions in the Q and A box, and I'll be reading out a selection afterwards. Um, so uh, over to you, Isaac. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, it seems to be frozen. Can everyone see me? Okay, good. Um, so let's see, what do I look like right now? Uh, hi, so I am a Chinese man in my early 30s. I don't really look in my 30s, but um, let's see, I have short hair on one side and long hair on the other. I'm wearing a, uh, like a green top, um, blue jeans. I'm sitting on a black chair in a somewhat over clustered room. And let's see. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, good. Uh, so this presentation is based on two chapters of my dissertation, focusing respectively on infrastructure and rights, that's R-I-T-E-S as seen on screen, within the context of classical Chinese philosophy. And what I am attempting to do in this presentation is an exercise in what I have been calling infrastructural thinking and use it as an orienting framework for exploring why it might be fruitful to engage with neural divergence through the ritualistic conception of persons obtained in confusion process cosmology. Let me just begin by uh, makes, making some preliminary remarks about infrastructure and what infrastructural thinking is. So I draw my understanding of infrastructure from the sociological work of Susan Lee Starr and Karen Rolliter, for whom infrastructure is not an artifact with pre-given attributes frozen in time, but something relational. What is infrastructure for some, say a flight of stairs, can be a barrier for others. Infrastructure does not simply refer to some material arrangement, rather material arrangements become infrastructure in relation to organized practices. Thus, we ask, when, not what, is an infrastructure? Analytically, infrastructure appears only as a relational property, not as a thing stripped of use. While it might seem natural, especially to philosophers, to begin an inquiry by asking the question, what is it, with the assumption that the object of our inquiry is, well, an object with decipherable qualities, this line of questioning runs into difficulty when approaching networks of relations where it is neither epistemically useful nor desirable to proceed from assumptions of discrete objecthood. A note of clarification, when I say infrastructure is a relational property, this is not a roundabout way of answering the question, what is infrastructure? To call something relational is not actually to say something about what it is. We're saying something about where it is, when it is, and how it is situated, with the understanding that the where, when, and how refers not to a fungible background for the occurrence of a stable and unchanging what, but key components in the constitution of a relational assemblage. So when I talk about infrastructural thinking, this is not a fancy expression for thinking about a category of object called infrastructure, 
The rather awkward phrasing is meant to communicate a more reciprocal relationship between the material processes of infrastructural operation and the activity we call thinking, so as to emphasize the systemic, uh, so as to emphasize the epistemic instabilities of any arrangement we may deem infrastructural, as well as attending to the materiality in the activity we call thinking. Infrastructural thinking proceeds from the understanding that the thinking activity is not autonomous. By way of this S knows that P model of an intentional deliberate subject coming to know contextually isolable propositions about some distinct unified object. Instead of preformed subjects thinking about something we're not already implicated in, we always think through with and sometime against the affordances and limitations of the various assemblages we inhabit, whether it is our own bodies, the physical spaces of our immediate surroundings, the economic and political situations we suffer from, or the media complexes structuring much of our social existence. Moreover, infrastructural thinking is not only interested in questions of how we think, through these various formations, but also how they think through us or how we are constituted and also intercepted in our subjectivity through the ways infrastructure thinks us. Now, depending on who's listening, the idea infrastructure thinks may or may not be controversial. The commonsensical view is that thinking is a bounded process within the brain. But this view has already been under pressure for quite some time, most notably by the extended mind model proposed by Andy Clark, which allows at least some aspect of human cognition to be realized by the ongoing work of the body and or the extra organismic environment. But even without that kind of a framework, I don't think the idea infrastructure thinks is entirely unintuitive. The material environment we inhabit has always been involved in producing the distinctions characteristic of what we understand as civilization between nature and society, culture and technology, human and the non-human. They give form to the relations between states and subjects and are constantly in the business of making claims about and reinforcing the boundaries of identity, social belonging, norms of human relationships, as well as the metaphysical, political, and emancipatory limits of what is imagined to be possible. The infrastructural operation of our material and political arrangements are not extraneous to thinking but are the constitutive contours that configures and limits the domain of conscious thought. To quote the media theorist John Durham Peters, ontology, whatever else it is, is usually just forgotten infrastructures. And we can say that infrastructure thinks precisely because it has always been the site for which we outsourced our need to think. Now, how infrastructure thinks is not reducible to a question about the intentions and plans of its builders and designers. This is not to suggest we would not benefit from considering such perspectives, but we're likely to learn a great deal more about the style, material, and labor cost of how such things are constructed rather than how they shape our thinking. Experts often at their own admission only have partial knowledge of their workings and are constantly compromised by the materialities and contingencies of infrastructure projects. To take one of the most frequently cited examples in disability studies, we might learn more about how infrastructure imagines the bodies of its users from an encounter between a flight of stairs and a wheelchair user than from doing a close reading of building blueprints Tanya Tichkovsky calls this environmental intentionality. It is not intentionality we can neatly attribute to some human mind, but something that is only made manifest during these kinds of encounters. As she writes, 
at every turn, at every stair, at every missing handrail and within every fixed seat classroom organized only for the intended student body so that even the presence of left-handed people is not imagined. The environment declares disabled students, we weren't expecting you to show up. What is not idiosyncratic is a belief reflected in the environment, in help, in special budgets, in widespread myth about that other university, this fabled elsewhere already set up for disabled bodies, that disabled peoples are ipso facto unintended participants. What I think this passage is very good at showing is a way power is exercised in the infrastructural enactments of ableism. This power is not merely repressive in the sense of acting as obstacle and barriers to access. This power is also active. That is, it actively produces disciplinary knowledge about the population it seeks to manage. In this case, it is directed towards establishing a singular manageable conception of who disabled people are as the unintended other or in simpler terms, this is what Foucault calls knowledge power. Infrastructure exercises its power by actively generating a kind of knowledge through its mode of address. In the case of disability, it interpolates its users through what Aimee Hamray calls a norme template, a figure taken to be representative of an average user whose presumption of universality often takes for granted as neutral, a particular white, European, non-disabled, youthful, and often masculine figure whose features remain unmarked. In formation with our infrastructural conditioning, this normate figure reproduces itself by way of a self-fulfilling prophecy, materializing the existence of these kinds of bodies as the most likely inhabitants of those spaces. From that, a matrix of institutional strategy gathers to institute an atmosphere of reason and unreason, what counts as reasonable or unreasonable forms of accommodations are no longer questions worth figuring out. They are in some way already settled at an infrastructural level. Expecting accommodations to be sy systemically extended to those who the institution was never meant to serve and had never expected to show up in the first place is always unreasonable and will be heard as little more than a tiresome complaint. And as Sarah Ahmed has told us, to be heard as, a, as making a tiresome complaint is to be heard as being tiresome, as distracting somebody from doing important work elsewhere. The lived experience of being disabled is not merely a matter of being a certain kind of body with certain fixed characteristics, but involve constant negotiations through, with, and sometime against the ways we are storied by these infrastructurally inscribed discursive expectations and institutional alibis directed towards the formation of what Shelley Tremaine has called an apparatus of disability. Infrastructural thinking is never concerned with questions such as what is the nature of disability, but how the formation of such apparatuses conceptualizes, reifies, homogenizes, and make manageable bodies by folding them into its regime of administrative legibility. To think infrastructurally is not merely to think about these kinds of apparatuses, but to interrogate the ways they think us. I hope this provides a workable outline of what I mean when I say infrastructural thinking. I want to turn now to the main concern of this presentation, which is rights. Again, that's R-I-T-E-S, rights as in rituals. Specifically, I'm concerned with the infrastructural question 
of how rights imagines the social and spatial order, and in turn, of neural divergence. So let's begin with what rights are. I have on my slides a passage from The Little Prince next to an illustration from the book known, um, from the character simply known as the fox. The passage um, includes a rather curious, almost magical understanding of rights as one makes one day different from other days, one hour different from other hours. Now within the narrative context of this passage, uh, rights were meant to be deployed as a strategy for taming or domesticating the fox. What's important to no note is that rights in this context doesn't proceed to tame the fox by subjecting them to a series of military drills or whatever violent disciplinary process we may usually associate with domestication. Instead, it works here by ceremoniously circumscribing a kind of temporal spatial order, generating the contours of a taken for granted order of everyday life where domestic relationships can take place. Continuing the passage, there is a right, for example, among my hunters, every Thursday, they dance with village girls. So Thursday is a wonderful day for me. I can take a walk as far as the vineyards, but if the hunters dance at just any time, every day would be like every other day. And I should never have any vacation at all. This is admittedly a banal example, but one important theme that comes through in this example is that rights are not simply something we do, but something that configures the spatiality and temporality of our habitus. The logic of rights is primarily infrastructural. And this understanding of rights is something Chinese philosophy, especially within the tradition of Confucian cosmology takes very seriously. But before proceeding further into that, I want to clarify a couple of misconceptions we might have about what rights are. So rights are not ancient practices from long ago. They occupy every place in modern society on different scales of visibility. We might think of large ceremonial spectacles, such as weddings, funerals, sports events, or presidential inaugurations, but more often they fade into the background as the banal conducts and gestures of everyday life. Some of, our some of our rights can include handshakes, facial expressions, eye contact, standardized greeting phrases, or small talks, such as exclamations about the weather. The most obvious function of rights is social lubrication, ensuring the smoothness of our interactions. Everywhere we find human interactions, we can find rights, and that includes even the internet we can expand this list of rights to include things like uh, the short, the messaging shorthands, emoticons, retweets, or meme sharing. That's not to say they are universally recognizable or rigidly observed at all times, but their use can often signal membership within a community or sub-community. Rights is something all of us do, but perhaps because of that, Rights are also the sort of things that philosophy, the serious study of big important ideas, usually ignores. One important thing to note about rights is that their primary purpose is not to communicate information or propositions. Instead, their functions tend to be more infrastructural or atmospheric by way of setting the tone, breaking the ice, and otherwise simplifying or giving to our interactions some semblance of stability and familiarity. We're exempt from having to think particularly deep over how to communicate our non-aggression to strangers when we can outsource that need to think to codified expressions and etiquettes of politeness that are within our reach. To put this in a more lofty way, rights spiritualizes the social world 
giving it a desirable black box-like quality, or as Barry Allen would put it, rights enables us to complete things by turning them into black boxes with which we can interact without forcing, permitting humans and non-humans to vanish into each other prosthetically, each augmenting the other. Now, within critical madness studies, what I have been calling rights up to this point coincides with the expanded sense Margaret Price gives to rhetoric, expanded against the classical Aristotelian account of rhetoric as the ability to discern the available means of persuasion. On Price's account, rhetoric is a way we communicate with each other, not only in writing or by speaking, but also in visual ways like pictures or even in subtle ways like the expression on our faces or the attitudes we bring to each other. Rhetoric is both familiar and unfamiliar. It is the water in which we all swim, but a term rarely used in everyday life. Like rights, rhetoric's function is not primarily informational, but infrastructural and atmospheric. Rhetoric is about communication, not in the sense, not in that instrumental sense we typically use the word, but relates to a wider sense of the word communication from Latin communicare, meaning to impart, share, or make common. The root munis relates to public offering of gifts and duties during various Roman ceremonies and relates to such words as munificent, community, meaning, or German Gemeinschaft. The Latin communicatio can encompass the dialogical or interactive sense we give to communication, but it was not in the least mentalistic and was generally a process involving tangible things. I made a point to stop myself before getting too carried away with this. But the main point here is that rhetoric tend to latch onto this wider sense of communication, meaning partaking, being a communicant, and generally suggests belonging to some form of social body, a community. Rhetoric circumscribes a domain for the enactment of human propensities, serving as the very ground of human relation, relatability, and sociality generally. But it is also for these very same reason that those of us who are autistic experience rhetoricity as something highly regulative. In the words of Remy Yergo, rhetoric builds spaces that occlude the autistic because the autistic supposedly represents the asocial edges of rhetoric. Its function as a precondition for humanness or personhood is typically and deeply connected to how we conceive sociality or our mode of relating and relatedness with our neurotypically human surrounds. Rhetoric comprises how we learn things and how we live. Autism, by contrast, signals the dissolution of such learning. This dissolution is sometimes presented as all-encompassing and at other times is claimed as a matter of degree or severity. We, the autistic, are that which contrasts. Now, there are some difficulty in trying to build an account of neurotypicality based on one's relationship to rhetorics. And that has to do with the perception that rhetorics is a secondary phenomenon. We don't usually think of rhetoric as playing this constitutive and infrastructural role in shaping the contours of sociality. Instead, we make pseudo biological claims like man is a social animal, which emphasizes this ontology that begins by positing a subject, positing sociology as some attribute enclosed within the skin of the subject. And at some point down the line, we get rhetoric maybe as one of its many activities. And this is a misconception shared. Uh, 
And this is a misconception shared in the ways we understand rites and rituals, which is often seen as a secondary phenomenon. We draw on the same notion of a subject that came preloaded with beliefs, intentions, ideologies, and prejudices. Rites and ritual shows up only later on as an ephemeral aesthetic embellishment. This kind of an approach makes it, among other things, difficult to recognize Chinese philosophy as actually philosophical, whereas Western philosophy has this image of being a critical, enlightenment, anti-dogmatic tradition. Chinese philosophy tend to invoke the image of a wise, bearded old man telling us how to live our lives. It's sometime taught in philosophy, but usually as a piece of curiosity. But more often, it is appropriated by self-help charlatans interested in telling us why we should listen to our parents and clean our rooms. So within Chinese philosophy, rights is translated from the character Li. This is not a bad translation, but as we can see on the slide, Li also encompasses things such as manner, offering of gifts, political institutions. Um, in fact, Confucius himself is committed to the idea that politics can and should be conducted through rites and rituals alone. We'll get back to that one. Li is something that cannot be understood outside. Uh, Li is something that cannot be understood outside uh, the conception of personhood in Confucian cosmology. Roger Ames and David Hall suggest ritual propriety for the word Li, and this translation emphasizes propri uh, this translation as propriety draws on the Latin root proprius, meaning making something one's own emphasizing the process of personalization and subjectivation out of which selfhood is enacted through ritual performances. In Confucianism, the mantra is not, I think, therefore I am, but should, but rather should be through communicating. Again, remember that expanded sense of communication. Through communicating, we are becoming together as well as through communicating, I am becoming a critically self-conscious we. This always collaborative, discursive process of becoming persons is why the language of Rose is so powerful in expressing what is indeed a more robust narrative notion of agency. For the Confucians, persons do not live inside their skin. They exist only in their associations. People are not individuated substances. They are a second order abstraction from their relations. What we call persons is only a shorthand for referring to a function of habitual patterns of relationship. The self is not a private container holding all of our essences that can be examined by way of introspection the self is part of an infrastructural complex. It is always the story of evolving personal identities emerging through, with, and sometime against the material and narrative contours of relationality. Like infrastructures, we should not ask what is a person. We must ask the irreducibly contextual and generative question whence and whether persons. Instead of introspection, Roger Ames gives us a neologism, introspection with an A, whereas introspection is oriented inwards. Introspection implies starting from within and proceeding outwards. The idea of introspection is not that we are looking out instead of looking in, but that we are looking in by looking out. I know this sounds a little weird, but it follows from the implication that our sense of self comes not from Cartesian interiority. Getting to know the self is a matter of introspecting upon the infrastructural relations 
out of which persons emerge by way of living embodiment. Now we find a complementary account of self and community in the work of Hannah Arendt, um, where the idea of self and community are viewed not in terms of substances, but as what we might derive or retrieve from our relation to artifices. Like all great philosophers before and after her, she does this by talking about tables and chairs. Like a table around which people are gathered, that world relates and separates men. At the same time, only the experience of sharing a common human world with others who look at it from different perspective can enable us to see reality in the round and to develop a shared common sense. Like rituals and rites, the table both connects and separates us. By taking it away, we remove the barrier keeping us apart, but we also remove the only tangible thing that connects us. The tangible surface, which gives some semblance st of stability to our identity. Or in her words, men, in their ever-changing nature notwithstanding, can retrieve their sameness, that is their identity, by being related to the same chair and the same table. This self, sense of selfhood is not an individual possession, but an effect generated from our dwelling within and by means of infrastructure. We are subjects only in so far as we are subjected to the conditions that conditions us and among other things, enjoys the constancy and safety we might retrieve from our infrastructural formations. To ask whence and whether persons is to inquire into the ways the dense formation of material, social, political, and aesthetic forces that works to capture, orient, condition, intercept, model, or otherwise delimit the gestures, behavior, opinions, and discourses that are constitutive of our sense of selfhood. We're near the end, but there is something I need to make really clear. The reason I talked about confusion process cosmology is not because I'm trying to romanticize its emphasis on relationality and reciprocity. They're not a panacea against the excesses of enlightenment individualism. Sorry. As those with even the most cursory understanding of Confucianism should know, Confucianism is meant to be a conservative manner of conducting statecraft and rites and rituals spells out its logic of governance. They originate as formal adherences that were once performed during the early Shan dynasty at stipulated time to reinforce the political and religious status of the royal participants within the extended family lineage and to punctuate the season of the life at court. And ritual propriety meant quite literally knowing one's place in the formalities and thus knowing where to stand. The informal, this informal form of governance is probably not all that unfamiliar to those whose experience firsthand uh, academia's code of collegiality. The very institutional strategy of collegiality relies on a governing configuration of relationality and an expectation to internalize within ourselves its effective demands. And if such affects are particularly alienating, we risk becoming aliens to, oh, sorry, whoops. We risk becoming aliens to ourselves at the cost of being connected. It is a governing logic that is at once atmospheric and infrastructural. And in fact, the Confucian Book of Rights frequently invokes infrastructural metaphors. Rights are meant to rid the world of evils and scourges 
just like dams and dikes, which are built up to prevent floods. Like hydraulic works, rites are meant to collect and channel our dispositions and ensure they gather in the right places and flow in the proper directions. But one must ask, what does such a gathering do? This is, in fact, how Sarah Ahmed responds to what Hannah Arendt has said earlier about tables. Arendt would clearly mourn the loss of the table, as such a loss would make social gathering impossible. And yet, we must ask, what is the point of such a gathering? The table in its very function as a kingship object might enable forms of gathering that direct us in specific ways that make some things possible, but not others. Gathering, in other words, are not neutral, but directive. In gathering, we may be required to follow specific lines. What direction do we take when we gather in this way by gathering around the table? The very fact of gathering should not be romanticized. The question one must watch out for is how such a gathering directs, orients, and perhaps conceptualizes us in manageable ways. How does its infrastructure and rhetoricity thinks us? I want to end with some remarks about neural queerness which is increasingly being used alongside neurodivergence. Um, one thing worth emphasizing is that neural queerness is not a fixed identity, but a form of becoming, a style of disorientation. It is not something we are, but something we do, something we must all learn to do, something I am still learning to do. And I hope that infrastructural thinking can be a means for which we queer thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was such an incredibly rich and interesting talk. And um, I, it, yeah, I was, it's, I was really impressed by how you managed to bring all, together all these different threads um from Ahmed to Confucius and um, to neuroqueering in such an interesting way so thank you so much um so please I'm sure lots of people will be wanting to ask little things so please do put them into the um Q a um whenever you're ready um and I think I'll if if it's okay I'll just kick off with a question myself I've actually got so many questions um but um but um just something I was thinking towards the end and I guess I would like to hear more about neuroqueering and I, I something I was wondering while you were speaking and what I was wondering how how neuroqueering would come in um, and I know there are different definitions of neuroqueering as well and, and it's one of these things which is kind of inherently hard to define um, so maybe my understanding of it is 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 different to yours so I'd like to hear more about, about your definition too if you've got your understanding but something I was wondering is about autistic stimming and sometimes stimming is, is described as ritualistic. Um, and I think that might be sometimes a, more of a medical, uh, or at least that, that arises in, the, in, the, in a medical perception of autism. But um, I wonder if, we, if you can, can you think of stimming as rights? Um, and, uh, or would collective stimming, could that be a, for, a form of right? If it, especially if it kind of is used in a way, even not intentionally, but if it kind of um, challenges infrastructure or challenges what counts as reasonable um I, I, yeah i'd just be really interested to hear, hear yeah, more about I, that I would, yeah i would think so uh, i would think there is a possibility of resistance for stimming as um rights but one of the thing about rights is also that they don't really stand on their own there are things that are captured atmospherically as a way of produ producing certain neurotypical ways of being. So there's a way that what counts as a proper right may be, um, uh, may be related to, I guess, what Shelley calls this um, whole apparatus of disability. There's a way that, um, uh, but um, that I haven't fully thought through, through that, but I, I think there's potential for resistance. I don't really know if we want to necessarily call that a right, 
but a way of maybe a counter right. I don't know if that necessarily answers your question. Hey, that, it is something that, I have that's, to think that's really interesting. Work. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks. So. Yeah, I, I need to think more about this too. I think. Okay. Um, thank you. So uh, next up, a question from uh, Amandine Katala, um, who says, thank you so much for this brilliant talk. Could you say a little more about how you construe the practice of neuroquering and how you envision this as part of the way forward? So I mentioned trying. Um, so one of the thing I, I, uh, I began is talking about infrastructural thinking as a particular way of also querying the typical way thinking starts. We begin at least in philosophy, we began with the question, what is? And while working through infrastructure, one of the questions I constantly have to wrestle with is, uh, so what is infrastructure? <laughs> People would just ask me this. Um, and um, I can, and at one point, I just got so good at providing them with a very complex definition. And that seems to be enough that seems to be satis satisfying for them. And it feels less like I'm giving them a proper understanding of what infrastructure is, but so much as playing this game of what thinking has become, uh, of providing set definition that treats infrastructure as, as definable objects. Um, and I, I don't really know. Uh, so I kind of mentioned that the ways of infrastructural thinking is a way of going about querying thinking. It's not necessarily going to be the only way, and I don't want to make any authoritative claims about how querying works. That's extremely not queer. <laughs> uh, but one of the things that at least I'm trying to do is to, rever to reverse things, and hopefully that's not my legacy, where it's just that I'm switching words around instead of how we think infra about infrastructure, but it's how infrastructure thinks us. But um, I think it's potentially useful to do these sorts of things. I don't know if that makes sense or if that's a particularly helpful way of answering your questions, but. Uh. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Amdine says, thanks. That's very helpful. Um, okay. please, please do submit more, more questions. Um, I, could you actually give, I, just for, for me, could you give a concrete example of, of just, just following up the, the same kind of, what would a, like if I wanted to, uh, I don't know if I'm putting this right, but if I wanted to neuro, start neuro querying infrastructure, what kind of things would, would I, what would I do? Or what would be a good example of that? Mm. So one of the things that infrastructural thinking aim for is, I, I did mention this, the way, infrastructure thinks us. Um, and I guess it involves moving away from, um, from this idea of, uh, how do I want to talk about it? Um, I usually, let's see. So I've TA'd for, so I've TA'd for a, aesthetics class before, and I usually begin the class by telling my students that I think aesthetics is the most important branch of philosophy. And that's you. And one of the reason I think so is because every single philosophical concept tend to have an aesthetic component to it. The way we imagine something like the good life, it's not an idea we have. It's an idea that's processed by various cultural imaginations. The idea of, of the heterosexual imaginary, the various bourgeois notions of what a good life consists of, all these different idea configure, calibrates, and thinks this concept that we like to think of as abstract. We can also, um, the idea of modernity, there's a particular aesthetic component to that. It's not something, it's not an, an abstract idea we think of, but it's calibrated by all these very, by the various aesthetic formations that has real effect on how these ideas are thought of that we would then just um, uncritically latch onto. Uh, justice, all these various things we think of as abstract, it's not 
one way we might go about it is not so much how do we un define or understand these concepts, but how are these ideas materially and aesthetically processed before we even get to them? I guess that might be a certain way I would approach it. Uh, political aesthetics is something I've been thinking about for a while now, but um, it's, and when it comes to infrastructure, uh, it's, uh, we began from infrastructure. How does uh, like borders imagine citizenship? How does the codification of intimacy imagine love? And, and these are some of the ways we, um, these are some of the kind of questions that are conducive to an infrastructural thinking framework. Thank you. Um, I. I think you may have just answered the next question, but I'll, I'll okay. just read it out in case you've got anything to add. Um, but that, that was very comprehensive. So um, Maeve O'Donovan asks, well, says, thank you so much for a thought provoking paper. I wonder if you could bring us back to the practical and share what this would look like in the classroom. Um, but you, I, I realize you've just given an example of that, but if, if you would like to say any, any more of that, I'm sure everyone would like to, like, would like to hear more. Um, uh. Um, well, I don't really know if there are anything else to mention. I think she has another question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good, good point. So a new question. Uh, can you say more about counter rights? I am interested in how they work with or against existing oppressive rights. Uh, so I don't. Uh, so when it comes to counter rights, I guess I don't want to lay out a specific methodology, um, but one of the things um, I think it's very important is to be attentive of a way of um, narrating neurotypical identity and, uh, and also neuroqueer, um, that did not come out right. Um, I guess attend to the to question of infrastructure uh, rights and rhetoric. I, I, I don't really know exactly how to talk systematically about counter rights, but it involves a certain way of attending to them as real forces and not as something that's secondary, to, not as an entirely secondary phenomenon that's derived from something else like prejudice or ideologies or um, or the the ways in which that these rights and um, rights tend to rights and rhetoric tend to be thought of as secondary phenomenon that are fully explainable by mental categories like prejudice and ideologies um, makes it difficult to approach the question of counter rights. I, um, I would suggest begin by considering them more holistically, not and not really as not as these derived epiphenomenons. Thank you. Um, there's just a comment from uh, Jane Dryden here who says, "Neuroqueerly narrating neurotypicality might be pretty nifty, actually." Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, I haven't done a lot of that, but I yeah. <laughs> It's something in, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I, I thought you. I thought you had finished. Please uh, go, go ahead. Yeah, it wasn't that important. Uh, did you have another thought? Um, I was actually wondering it just as you was answering the last question. I was, I was thinking about again so, something about neuroqueer queering and counter rights, mm. and this like neuroqueering seems to me to be something which is probably always changing by its nature it's not fixed it's it's kind of mm -hmm. that seems to be part of the point and yeah. rights are kind are kind of more more fixed by their nature um so a counter rights be would they be rights right. at all or would they be something which is fundamentally uh, so rights are not necessarily oh, sure. fixed that's one of the important things to know about rights they're not rights in relation to some sort of external divine principle they're always contextual they're always related to what is the most contextually appropriate way to conduct yourself in a situation. But it's all, but it's for the same reason why rights might be, might produce um, a governing atmosphere of oppressive collegiality in a department, for example. 
the this is um uh sorry i missed like the beginning of your question what what, what was i trying to answer just now <laughs> uh, um i i i was thinking about how new, neuro querying seems to be kind of something which is probably fluctuating by its very by its yeah. very nature and i wondered how compatible flux of practices is with rights and if if i guess if, if counter rights have a similar structure to rights but mm. like a, like a different more emancipatory aim or something or if they've got a fundamentally different they might, structure yeah they might be fundamentally disruptive the way sarah ahmed talks about complaints the way that complaint the way that complaints has this interruptive feel that might be a good starting point i guess Great, thank you. Um, okay. Just checking, uh, what time uh, are we? It finishes on the hour, doesn't it? Can, Probably. Can, can, so we we allow uh, ten minutes, I think, for the break. So we should be finishing any time now. Okay. Right. Good. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is a, a good time to end. So just to say, well, thanks again, Isaac. That was a as I said before, it's an incredibly rich and interesting talk, and um, it's given me loads to think about, and, and I'm sure everyone else too. Um, so thanks everyone for your questions and for tuning in.